What do you think of when you think of a politician? Just reflect on it. Most of the time, you're probably not thinking of somebody who looks like me. You think of a stereotype, basically an older white dude in a suit. <laughs> there you go, there he is. You've seen him on the front cover of newspapers, you know, on the six o'clock news, and scattered around your neighborhood, his face on hoardings in the lead up to election time. You don't really trust him, you don't really know him, but somebody's gotta do the job. And the guy seems like he's kinda the lesser of the evils. And heck, you might even have a beer with him. Maybe. <laughs> So Statistics New Zealand data demonstrates that less than half of us trust government institutions. But what about politicians themselves? Well, the situation is actually much more dire. So <laughs> a rather ad hoc survey this election, this general election, which we've all just had and hopefully participated in, demonstrated that only one in every 50 New Zealanders trust politicians themselves. Why is that? I mean, we voted for them and elected them, didn't we? Well, I think it's got a lot to do with who we think our politicians are and how we see ourselves, not just in relation to them, but in relation to the rest of society. Basically, it all boils down to trust. And this is what I scientifically call the gap between people and politics. So that gap is the reason why I initially ran for office. I couldn't see myself, my friends, my family, my classmates, my coworkers in politics. It felt performative, not substantive. It felt foreign, not representative. It kind of just felt like a maintenance of the way that things are. So how does that work, right, when, when we actually elect people? Well, it turns out that hundreds of thousands of us actually didn't turn out and elect our politicians this general election. 20% of New Zealand's population decided not to vote. How does that work? How are we not taking to the streets at the moment? Well, I guess that's because you know, there's no other real explanation for it except that we're in a bit of a lull. For some reason, we don't expect and cannot foresee change coming out of an institution so far removed from our daily lives, so entrenched in bureaucratic jargon and technocratic waffle, especially when our communities are fragmented at an historic scale. So this is me. Uh, running for the Auckland mayoralty last year, uh, kind of ish standing out like a sore thumb amongst the other more stereotypical politicians that I alluded to earlier. A lot of people came out of the woodwork to give me advice when I first put myself forward for election. Many people uh, told me that I should just be older, uh, that, <laughs> that I should wait a little while, you know, pick up some of that magical life experience, Juju. Uh, other people told me that I had to smile more. Uh, I was basically being asked to become a politician, to shave off my edges, dull down the idealism and turn back the desire for change. By virtue of my age and my gender, I cannot be the stereotypical politician. But as I've already shown, research kind of reflects that we kind of hate that guy. We, we don't trust him at the very least. So why does change make us so uncomfortable? Well, I've got a theory. And it's that I think that change might remind us a little bit too much of ourselves. You see, if I can be a politician, then your grandma can be too. If I can be a politician, then the local dairy owner, your geography teacher, your bus driver, your little sister can be politicians and they have every right to be. But to accept that is to shatter assumptions and give up the illusion that politics is something done to us, outside of us, instead of for us or with us. To accept that all of us could be and perhaps should be politicians is to accept accountability for the role that any and all of us can play in society. 
So my next question is, what do you think of when you think of a citizen? Probably not thinking of yourself. You may think of, you know, a businessman filing his taxes, or a public servant, or perhaps an activist, or a protester. So why don't we think of ourselves? Because citizenship is primary in a legal sense, but in a social sense, it is, if anything, a secondary consideration. It's subservient to our individuality. It's unusual for us to think of ourselves in such a light, but all politicians are citizens first, and all of us are actually born citizens. Look around you. You can actually look around you, or you can choose not to, that's fine. <laughs> I was told this is supposed to be interactive, uh, to get you all, yeah, blood flowing, last presentation, you know how it is. So, that's us. All of us are citizens. We're the people who make up society. We're the people from whom politicians are made and to whom politicians are supposed to be accountable. So that's the apparent paradox, right? We get to choose our politicians, but for some reason we don't trust them, so surely we would actually just be choosing the people from among us who are the most trustworthy. But what is the gauge of trust? What is it that we are actually trusting our politicians for? Well, uh, that's another point of contention, and I'd argue a symptom of the same issue. It's 2017, and we're kind of used to talking past each other at this point. We have kind of given up explaining to each other, and we've all got the internet, and that automatically curates proof that I am right and you are wrong. It's a problem that's compounded by the increasing precariousness of modern life. A home and a job are not things to be taken for granted in the modern first world. We've got the gig economy and record low rates of home ownership without the security of rental, uh, of rental protection. What that means is that we are increasingly unlikely to know our neighbors and our coworkers. We are increasingly unlikely to form community. So, uh, this is basically the problem that we've got, right? After decades of reform in economic and social sectors, we have become increasingly encouraged to just look after ourselves. The prevailing mantra has become one of personal responsibility. And that's fine, you know, personal responsibility, it's important. But it cannot come at the expense of political responsibility. Personal responsibility cannot solve the biggest issues of our time. Those issues, they look like climate change. They look like record rates of wealth inequality in this country at home. They look like the refugee crisis. They look like wars seemingly raging eternally overseas. These are problems that as individuals are far too big to comprehend. They're arguably the very reason that we formulated civil society and accepted democracy as a mass, convenient decision-making tool. Civil society, by the way, and just for the record, is defined as a society considered as a community of citizens linked by common interest and collective activity. Unbridled self-interest is then the antithesis to civil society. Time and again, research has shown that when we expect other people to act in self-interest, it gives us an excuse to do so. Basically, we behave badly when we think other people will. This kind of feedback loop is terrible. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy and a hiding to nowhere. So what we need is a fuse breaker. And what I'm reminded of is George Orwell's kind of resounding thought, which I think is particularly important in a time of fake news and alternative facts. In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth feels like a revolutionary act. So where are we going? And 
how do we get things back on track? Well, let me tell you. I'm, I'm a philosophy nerd, uh, for those who may not know. That was something which was neglected from my biography. Uh, but I'm a big fan of this philosopher, John Rawls. He had this theory called the veil of ignorance. It's basically this thought experiment where you try and design a society from scratch. But the hitch is that you don't know who or where you will be placed in that society. The argument goes that most of us will end up designing a society where the position of the person who is in the worst, lowest position, they are still living a life that is not just livable, but ultimately meaningful. That is designing a society from the position of the common good. That is what I would argue is how politicians should design legislation for civic society. But we have to demand and expect that they do that. We have to trust them to do it and be mad as hell if they don't, to the point that we'll vote them out or stand ourselves. We have to trust other citizens. It can no longer be about you versus me. It has got to be about us. So an example of how that trust won't come easy is, I think, best evidenced by the much mythologized and much talked about youthquake from this year's general election, which didn't really seem to make that much of an appearance. The cliche tells us that trust takes an age to build, a moment to break, and a lifetime to repair. Young people, like middle-aged and older people, have by and large grown up in an age of mistrust. In order to repair that, we have to build community. So this here is a portion of my campaign team from this year's general election. They are a crew of young people brought together by faith in a better future, but also, wait for it, an idea worth spreading. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that was, was a good joke. Uh, so <laughs> that idea, that idea is building communities on the foundation of trust. It is modeling participation by doing it ourselves and trying to generate ripple effects through our communities. Because the fact of the matter is, is that as individuals, you know, we can donate to charity or compost our waste or call up Talk Back Radio and have a bit of a go. But as a collective, we can end intergenerational poverty, we can take action on climate change, and we can build the foundations of tolerance. Systemic change, though, requires trust. And the status quo approach festers in distrust. A kind of mischievous, powerful, wealthy, and currently often political class capitalize on our fear of other people. It is a classic example of divide and conquer. And we have only to look around and realize the common interests that we all share and the power that we have in numbers to disrupt it. So this leads me to my final point, which is that democracy is just a means, not an end unto itself. In the words of Winston Churchill, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all of the others. It is literally just a tool to make decisions. Decisions are almost always compromises. And compromises in our society, when a lot of people are at the table, have to be built on trust. Trust is founded in relationships in communities and in good faith. So I think it's crucial to remember that our politics does not start and end every three years with a general election. Respect breeds respect. Trust breeds trust. Our politics lives in our relationships with each other, but also in things as so perceivably small as our daily challenges, but as thing, in things as massive and monolithic as the challenges of our time. 
In summation, society is made up of citizens. We, as citizens, elect our politicians to make decisions for us and to make the rules, essentially. We expect those politicians to be representatives of us, so we should expect them to come with our humanity. That means, yeah, with our ideals, but also with our flaws. And I think that in looking for the circuit breaker in order to break the cycle of distrust, perhaps the best thing that you can do is look to your communities, look around, find someone who you admire and trust and support them in running for office. Perhaps the people's revolution looks like a healthy dose of earnest naivety and belief in our better nature. My name is Chloe Swarbrick, and I am utterly privileged to be one of your new MPs. I am 23, in case you weren't aware, and I have struggled with anxiety and depression. I only just learnt how to ride a bicycle a few weeks ago. And the reason that I am telling you all of this is because if I can do it, you can do it too. Kia ora.